And if you would, folks, turn with me to John chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 10 through 14 this morning. There was a movie that came out the year uh, that I graduated high school that I've probably seen a hundred times uh, called Remember the Titans. Anybody ever seen that movie? It's a good movie. Um, it's based on a true story, and it's about a school in Alexandria, Virginia, right down the road here, uh, called T.C. Williams. Uh, and it was a school that, at the time, it was going through desegregation. The, the movie begins with everyone absolutely hating one another uh, because of the color of their skin. But through the work of a football coach, uh, a couple of football coaches, really, uh, the team ends up, they come together, and they start loving one another, and as a result, they learn to play the game of football together, and through their example, their, their community came together. I love movies that have good, just good old one-liners. I love, uh, I can have a conversation with somebody by just using movie one-liners one time. It's pretty fun. But I love movies that have good one-liners, and there's several from Remember the Titans. Uh, my favorite is from a scene where um, the, the team is practicing. It's before the season starts. They're out at camp. Uh, and it is hot outside. Uh, it's one of those August days in Virginia where it's just terribly hot and humid here sometimes. And, and they've been working hard for hours. They're doing two-a-days in practice, and they've just been working hard for hours. And one of the players goes over to the head coach, Coach Boone, who was played by Denzel Washington, and he says, Coach, we need a water break. We've been out here for hours. <laughs> and, and the coach says, What did you say? He says, We need a water break, sir. And the coach replies, it's one of my favorite movie, or lines from a movie of all time, and uh, I've said it to the youth before on Sunday nights when we would run around playing and getting hot and sweaty. He says, a water break? Water is for cowards. Water makes you weak. Water is for washing blood off your uniform, and you don't get any blood on my uniform, boy. You must be outside your mind. You ever been that thirsty? I have. I played soccer in high school. I was a, I was a defender, and if you were a defender on my team, you, you didn't allow a goal. Uh, my senior year one time, we didn't allow a goal for seven games. And so um, soccer's not like every other sport. Uh, there's no timeouts unless somebody gets hurt. Uh, there's no water breaks except during halftime. And if you're a defender, you don't leave the game unless you get hurt. You, you just stay in there. So if you want to come out of the game, you're going to have to act like you're hurt or either you're going to have to mess up bad enough for the coach to take you out of the game. But if you're a defender and you're a starter, you, you stay in the game the entire time. And if you're a, and if you're a defender and you, and you don't start, you, you don't play. And so you're just running and you're running and you're running, running, but there's just no stopping. And I remember getting really, really thirsty sometimes. The truth is we, we need water to live. Uh, water is essential to life. And there's a lot of factors that go into it, and different experts will say different things on how long it is that a, sp a person can, can live without water. And there's a lot of uh, factors that go into that. But the fact of the matter is, is that we need water to live. There's, there's no life without water. Uh, marine biologist uh, Sylvia Earle said one time, there's plenty of water in the universe without life, but nowhere is there life without water. Jesus has a lot to say about life and water in our passage for today. In verses 10 through 14, the word drink or, or drink can be seen four times. And, and the word thirst, or the word water, he see, oh, we see that seven times right here. Let's stand and let's show reverence for God and for his word as we read our passage for today from the Gospel of John. This is verses 10 through 14. This is the word of God. It says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and, and drank from it himself and as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Let's pray together. Father, as I read this passage this morning, 
I'm reminded of the extreme thirst that I experienced before I first believed. I'm reminded that you are the only one that can satisfy a thirsting soul. Not the love of a spouse, not the love of an earthly father or a mother, not money, not riches. God, you alone are sufficient to meet the need and the longings of our souls. Father, there's some in this place that probably don't know that. They're dead in their trespasses and sins. And Father, I pray today that you make them alive together with Christ. I pray you use the preaching of your word this morning in this place to save someone. I pray you breathe new life into deflated lungs this morning. I pray it happened today. Not tomorrow, Lord, I pray it happened today. Your grace is sufficient. Your power is made perfect in weakness. So, Father, I pray that you display your power in this place this morning. In spite of my own weakness. God, I pray you speak. I pray you speak through the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In verse 10 here, Jesus begins speaking of living water. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. And he, and he would have given you living water. Look, in Jesus' day, living water uh, referred to fresh running water, not the stagnant water that you might find at the bottom of a well. But for those that are familiar with the whole of God's word, the whole of scripture, uh, we will see this as a reference to the gift of eternal life. In, in Jeremiah 21, verse 3, God describes himself as the fountain of living waters. In Psalm 36, 9, it says, For with you is the fountain of life. In Isaiah 44, verse 3, it tells us of the coming day of salvation. It says, For I will pour water on the thirsty land and the streams of the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring. The very last chapter in, in the, all of the Bible, but Revelation 22, it speaks of the river of the water of life. One writer describes living water as the soul-satisfying grace of God or, or that which only God can give to satisfy a soul. It's the, it's the transforming life and, and power that God alone gives in and through the gospel of his son that leads to eternal life and that satisfies as nothing else can. In the offer that Jesus makes right here in verse 10, he, he summarizes his gospel in terms of two things that we've got to know, that, that we've got to know. There's two things we've got to know. First, he says, if you knew the gift of God. First, we need, we need to know that God has a gift for those that will receive it. Isaiah 55, 1 says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. All we must do is come, and he'll satisfy our part souls. And second, Jesus says, if you knew who it is that is saying to you. Second, we need to know who Jesus is. We need to know the Savior sent by God to bring eternal life. And those two statements right there, there's, there's a good summarization of the gospel there it's what we need to know in order to be saved we need to know what the gift of god is and we need to know jesus as the one who gives the gift and jesus promises if you knew the gift of god and who it is that's saying to you give me a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water and this response from this woman right here it reveals a whole lot of things about her we, we'll get back into some of, the, some of the particulars about her next week when we, when we come back to this place. But, but we find out a lot of stuff from this woman just from verse 11 right there. It's, she says, sir, you, you have nothing to draw water with. And the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? We, we see her unbelief right here. We, we saw in John 3.19 a few weeks ago uh, as we were going through that passage that, that unbelief is caused by one's commitment to sin. So the reason that, that some people aren't going to come to Christ is because they're so committed to their sin. John 3, 19, the light is coming to the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because the works were evil. Love for sin keeps people from coming to Jesus. I spoke briefly last week that, that cultural or, or geographical barriers can also keep people from Jesus. Um, listen, if you live in a place where people that don't know Jesus don't go, you're probably not going to know Jesus yourself. Look, that's why we've got to support missions, folks. 
There are literally people that are going to go to hell based on where they were born because nobody's been there. Nobody goes there to tell them about Jesus. That's why we've got to support missions. We've got to support missions. We've got to help send missionaries because the fact that a person was born in another country might be the reason that they never hear about Jesus. And that ought to burden us, and that ought to, that ought to cause us heartache, and that ought to spring us into action to support missions. And in her response here, we see another reason why people don't believe. Spiritual inability. We've been speaking about this a bit on Wednesday nights, I think. But look, this Samaritan woman simply was not able to grasp what it was that Jesus was talking about. She was an earthly, worldly person, and she was incapable of thinking in spiritual terms. Like we talked about last Wednesday night, the Bible teaching that fallen mankind is unable to understand the things of God. Look, that's one of the reasons why we can't get mad at other people that don't know Jesus. Of course, they're going to sin like that's, that's, that's who we are. Of course, they're not going to do the things of God. They, they don't know God, and they're not able to discern the things of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us that the natural person, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. This woman is probably one of the greatest examples in all of the Bible about that. She can only think in terms of spiritual water. And, or, I'm sorry, she can only think in terms of physical water and, and literal wells. Nicodemus was a lot similar, who we talked about in the last passage. Jesus told him, just as he tells us, look, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For those of us that have been born again, by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which has caused us to repent and to believe the gospel. The woman's reply, look, if it weren't so heartbreaking, if her, if her reply right here wasn't so heartbreaking, it might even be a little bit comical. She didn't see how in the world he could offer any such thing as living water. First of all, he didn't even have a pail. He didn't have a bucket. Verse 11, sir, you don't have anything to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get the living water? And second, she couldn't see how in the world Jesus could be better than Jacob had been. Verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. How can you, Jesus? How can you do any better than Jacob? How can you be better than him? How can you do any better than Jacob has done? You know, people today have that same line of thinking about Jesus. People today think the same sorts of things. They don't don't take him seriously. He's not the head of a huge corporation. Uh, You can't see him on television. He's not a high-profile, visible world leader. So most people just don't think he matters. Jesus is thought to be of very little good in terms of worldly matters. That's why people won't submit to him as Lord. You know, a lot of people just want him as Savior. I know I've mentioned that before. But here's the thing, those two things aren't separable. Those two things are not separable. You don't get to pick which half of him you want. You either have him as Lord or you can't have him as Savior. That's how that works. If you will not have Jesus as Lord of your life, you don't have him as Savior. Worldly people, they only think about worldly things. Look, that was this woman's problem right here. She wasn't worried about salvation, she was worried about plumbing. She wanted it. Listen, she wanted an easier way to get better water from a well. It's the same as a lot of churchgoers today. Sadly, there's there's folks that will go, that want to go to church and get advice on relationships. They want to go and they want to hear a sermon series about marriage or or how I can raise my kids to not be complete heathens, just maybe partial heathens or or how I can get my son. Somebody really likes when I use the word dirtbag in my sermons. How in the world can I get my husband to stop being such a dirtbag? That's what I want to learn in church. I want you to tell me, preacher, how you can get my husband to stop being such a, a piece of garbage. They want sermons on how they can be more successful in their career field. People don't want theology. They don't, they don't want Jesus. They want his benefits. They could care less about any other portion of being a Christian. Just help me do better in my time on earth. That's what I want. That's why. That's what I want. They want his benefits. And look, folks, we've all got needs. We need water. 
uh, we need shelter, we need food. Look, I could go downstairs to Children's Church right now. Those guys could put a wonderful list together for me of the things that I need in my life. I've, I've got needs. You've all got needs. I really need a piece of cheesecake right now, but... This woman right here, Carl hates when I mention cheesecake. I'm sorry, brother. This woman had a laundry list of needs. She had all kind of needs. Look, this lady definitely needed some relationship advice, didn't she? As we'll look at next week, look, the woman, look, she was one proposal away. She was one proposal shy of no longer being able to count her husbands on one hand. Just one proposal was all it took. She needed some relationship advice. She carried around with her feelings of rejection. She needed something to take care of that. She needed some water. But, but listen, she had all kinds of needs. But her greatest need was to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. That was her greatest need. That's why, church, you will never, ever catch me. You might catch me dead, but you won't catch me alive. You're not going to catch me alive preaching some kind of topical-type sermon full of lifestyle tips and this self-help garbage that is handed out in a lot of our churches today. We don't need that. We need Jesus. We don't need how-to manuals. We need the gospel. Listen, when I'm feeling down... I'm talking not just, oh, man, I really could use some cheesecake or something other like that, or I really could use something. When I'm really feeling down, I'm talking really down. Look, I don't need someone to tell me to pick myself up out of the floor. I need Jesus. When I'm overwhelmed by the pressures of life, when you are overwhelmed with the pressures of life, when you're overwhelmed by, by career and, and, and family and spouse and all of these other things, look, you don't need worldly advice. We need Jesus. There was, a, there was a time in my life, look, where I didn't even want to get out of the bed in the morning. I kind of didn't this morning with the time change. But I'm talking for a different reason, a reason that I did not want to get out of the bed this morning or another morning. There was a time in my life when I didn't want to get out of the bed in the morning. Look, and I didn't, need some, I didn't need a better alarm clock. That's not what I needed. I didn't need someone to come in there and flip my mattress and throw me in the floor so that I'd get up. I didn't need somebody to throw a glass of water in my face. I needed Jesus. That's what I needed to get myself out of the bed. The Bible says that the gospel, not self-help, the gospel, Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. With, with that on his mind, Jesus replies to the woman in verse 13, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Every earthly source of satisfaction will never satisfy you. Every earthly source of satisfaction will always fail to satisfy your soul. Jesus says right here, this water is not going to satisfy you. The water in this well, it's not going to do what you want it to. If you haven't realized yet, he's not just talking about water right here. He's not just talking about water. You can fill in the blank. Look, that car, it's not going to satisfy you. That new purse, or your, your husband or your wife, your, your flower garden, because it's coming up on springtime. Go and fish, and look, none of those things are going to satisfy you. You can keep piling it on and piling it on and piling it on, filling up your schedule with all this mess that you love to do. You can keep buying all the things. You can keep going after all the things. You can work every single hour of every single day so that you can buy that boat, and you can have that beautiful house, you can have that beautiful yard, and it will not satisfy you. It's not. And I'll tell you why. It's because you were created with a thirst that can only be satisfied by Jesus. Only. Augustine said one time, and he said it better than I ever could, he said, God has made us for himself, and we will be, our hearts will be restless until it rests in him. Whether we know the verse or not, whether we know that um, Psalm 42.1 is about each of us, whether we know that or not, it doesn't change the fact that it really kind of is. As a deer pants for water, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. That's true of each of you. Whether you know it or not, that's what your soul needs. Whether you know it or not, it's not to go after all these different things of the world. It's to go after Jesus. It's to submit to him as Lord. You might have all this world has to offer. 
Some of you might. Some of you just still want those things. You might have riches. You might have a wonderful family. You might have a beautiful wife and beautiful children and a beautiful yard and a golden retriever and a 401k and you make other people sick to their stomach. (laughs) But you might be empty inside with all of those things because those things will not bring fulfillment. There's an aching void in your soul. It's, It's true of the billionaire and it's true of the person that doesn't have a nickel to their name. It's true of the world traveler and the person that's never left their hometown. In all the cups of this world is written the same exact truth. Whoever drinks of that water will be thirsty again. It's never enough. It's never enough. Malcolm Muggeridge, beside his wonderful name, that's a fantastic name, Malcolm Muggeridge, he was a successful journalist. Listen to what he wrote. And there's some big words in here, but I think we can pull out what he means. He says, I may pass for being a relatively successful man. People occasionally stare, me at, stare at me in the street. That's called fame. I can fairly easily earn enough to qualify for admission to the higher slopes of the inland revenue. That's success. Furnished with money and a little fame, I may partake of trendy diversion. He's talking about going on vacation. That's pleasure. It might happen once in a while that something I said or wrote represented a serious impact on our time. That's fulfillment. Yet I say say to you, and I beg you to believe me, multiply these tiny triumphs by a million. Add them all together, and they are nothing. They're less than nothing measured against one drop of that living water Christ offers to the spiritually thirsty. That was Jesus' message to the woman at the well. He told her that if she continued drinking from worldly cups, she'd keep on thirsting. She would remain unsatisfied. And he adds in verse 14, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Last week I gave you four C's of evangelism. Real quick today, I'm going to give you three C's regarding the water that Jesus offers. Number one, there is a condition for what Jesus offers. There's a condition. He says, whoever drinks, the condition is that you must drink. Look, Jesus does not send us on a quest to find that water either. He doesn't place some outrageous price tag on the water either. He just says, whoever drinks, whoever is willing to drink this, He's he's speaking of faith, of of simple faith. Look, Leon Morris said one time, the gift of living water, it's not a reward for meritorious service. It is a gift that brings to anyone who receives it, no matter how insignificant and limited he or she may be, a totally new experience, a new power, a new life, a life that is eternal. There's a condition, whoever drinks. And when we fulfill that condition of salvation, when we receive God's, uh, God's gift through faith alone, look, there's a consequence. There's a consequence. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Never be thirsty again. The consequence is that Jesus satisfies our souls. What that does not mean is that our trials are going to cease. Here's the thing. To follow Jesus is to take up our cross, and it's to endure hardships. It's not easy to be a Christian. We're going to have trials. We're going to endure hardships. But we gain fulfillment for our souls through our fellowship with God. And then here's the thing, thing. Here's the thing, folks. Earthly things start to lose their appeal for, uh, for, uh, for us. Our, our thirst for worldly and sinful things, it, it begins to diminish, it begins to fade away, and we find permanent satisfaction for the thirst of our souls. You know, it's crazy to me. There's a reason why the world can't accept that sort of thing, because the world tells us something entirely different. The American dream... American dream, let me go marry my high school sweetheart. Uh, we're going to spend our entire lives together. We're going to have wonderful kids. We're going to build this beautiful house with a white picket fence and, have a fence and have a golden retriever out here. And there's plenty of people that have that sort of thing, and they're not happy. 
They're miserable. It's because that's not what we were created for. Sure, those things are great. They're wonderful. They're beautiful. We, we'd all love to have those sorts of things. But you find a man in the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul, who's happier than any of us. He's in prison. He's been beaten. It's because he truly knew Jesus. He's, he had found permanent satisfaction for the thirst of his soul. And finally, there's a change that results from that sort of thing. Verse 14, the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. It refers to the new birth where the Holy Spirit indwells a believer. Look, to be born again is to have a spiritual fountain welling up within you as God himself lives and moves in your heart and, and in and out of your hands and your feet. The result of this change, it's able to be seen. It's able to be seen. It manifests itself in your faith and in your godliness and in the joy that indwells you. Psalm 16 I know I say this every week that I've always got a new favorite passage or whatever, but I look back on Psalm 16 all the time, and man, there's just not a better passage of Scripture as far as I'm concerned. Verse 11 in Psalm 16, In your presence, in your presence, God, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Do you experience that? Does that describe you? If you're not a Christian, that's what Jesus offers you. He offers you joy. You know, some people just think, and this is what I used to think when I was a teenager, that God is just this cosmic killjoy, that he wants to take all the things I like and he doesn't want me to do them anymore. That's what some people think today. It's just simply not true. God is the source of all joy. He's the source of true joy. He has created us for himself, and our hearts are completely restless, and we are completely empty until we rest in him. When we, when we have our time of invitation here in just a few moments, folks, look, respond to that invitation. Come and give your life to Christ. I got another question for you. If you're already a Christian, are you experiencing that joy? Perhaps you've been willing to receive salvation from Christ, but, but you've not submitted to his lordship of your life. You're, you're trying to do things your own way, and you've not found joy, and you've not found satisfaction as a result. Is that you? Are you filling your soul with water that will leave you thirsty again? If so, let me encourage you this morning. Give up fighting for worldly success. Stop drinking from worldly cups and renew your commitment to Jesus this morning, and you will find that the water that you once craved and that you once desired is as refreshing and is as satisfying as the day when you first drank. If that's you, you come and you renew your commitment to Jesus this morning. I've had, I've had church members tell me that leaves are already beginning to grow on, on some of the trees at their homes. And uh, some folks already have flowers blooming in their yards. It seems in a way that, that spring has sprung. I'm trying to help it spring a little bit too this morning. That's why I got this tie on. Taryn asked me what in the world I was wearing this morning because I had this tie on, but I had my little tweed hat on with the little ear flaps that come down that, that, uh, that uh, all the ladies uh, that go on our mystery lunch, that they love so much when I wear it. I, did, I, I looked like I was trying to, uh, that I thought it was sprinter or something. Spring slash winter. But it seems in a way the spring has sprung. Verse 14, one more time. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Let me ask you this. Has spring sprung in your heart? Has that spring sprung in you? If not, let me plead with you this morning as we're going to sing in a moment. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted and let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. There's hope for the hopeless and all who've strayed. Come sit at the table and come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. Lay down your burdens and lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. A wanderer, come home.
you're not too far. Lay down your hurt. Lay down your heart and come as you are. Let's pray.